Hello and welcome to Cup of Cosmology, the place for all your questions about the universe. My name is Diana Hooper and I'm a postdoctoral researcher currently at the University of Helsinki, where I study cosmology, which means I study the universe, the contents of the universe, how everything evolves, how everything interacts, basically all of the cool things happening inside the universe. It's a great topic. I love studying the universe and I love coming here and chatting to everybody about all of the cool things happening in the cosmos. Hey Ange, great to see you over on YouTube. And hey Scott, great to see you also on YouTube. I'm glad you were able to find the stream, both of you. And I think if everything went according to plan, we should be going out to YouTube and Twitter. There was a slight delay at the beginning because I was just checking that both were working. They all appear to be synchronized. Hey David Howden, great to see you. Very nice to see that. So many of the regulars have made your way over to the YouTube channel. Very much appreciate that. So for anyone who doesn't know me, I'm a theoretical physicist. Hey, James, great to see you as well. I study the universe and I love chatting about all the cool things happening inside the cosmos. If it's black holes, gravitational waves, the CMB, all of these topics are some of my favorite things to talk about and you know, basically anything in space. Now, I used to be live streaming on Periscope for a few years. When Periscope closed down, I moved over to HAPS, HAPS.TV or HAPS.co, and then HAPS closed down a couple of weeks ago. So now, as you can tell by the branding that you can see up here, I am testing out Restream today. I should be going out to YouTube and to Twitter on Restream. And I'm still not completely familiar with the studio and with the setup. So this is going to be a bit experimental today. There might be there might be a few technical issues. I ask for all of you to be a bit patient. If there are technical issues, I apologize in advance for that. Hey, David Dunn, great to see you as well. Thank you for stopping by. Thank you for being here. HAPS is officially done. Yeah, HAPS officially closed down on the 5th of May. I wanted to do a farewell stream on HAPS, but I was at my first in-person conference in two and a half years. So the day HAPS closed, I was actually at a conference and wasn't able to do a final stream. But yeah, HAPS is gone. And as David Howden is saying, I doubt YouTube will close anytime soon, which is why going forward, the best place to watch is going to be on YouTube. I think a couple of cosmology will mainly be on YouTube going forward. It was either YouTube or Twitch, and to be honest, I'm, I'm just not such a huge fan of Twitch. I've tried it. And yeah, I, I think for now I'll stick with YouTube, Twitter. Hopefully it's going up to Twitter as well. You got the, the YouTube coming up in 30 minutes notification. Thank you for letting me know. That is really good to know. I um, scheduled the stream, which is something I really like and something that I missed in perhaps the last few months. So um it's good that I can now actually schedule streams again. This is a huge advantage because then you'll get the notification in advance and then I can test my setup in advance. So it makes everything just that much easier for me. So um, yeah, it is, uh, it is nice to be able to schedule streams in advance. One thing that I am going to have issues with is I can not actually share images properly. I think I haven't yet figured out how to share images in Restream. I don't think I can on the free version but I can screen share. So we're just going to wing it. We're going to go with screen share and, and hope for the best. But if there are any issues, um, then, then we will just try to resolve them as they come up. And I just want to test what happens if I click here. I think I can present things on screen. So you should see down below here a comment, which is nice because I can just put comments on the screen. And what else can I do here? I can reply to you. I can reply. I can block you on YouTube. Oh, I can put people in timeout. Nice. Not that I plan on putting anyone in timeout, was just um, looking at all of the buttons here and seeing what I could do. Very nice, very nice. Just got a lot of new buttons to play with. I've tested out the studio, but I can only see the comments. So I think most of you are watching on YouTube. Now, one thing I can do, I think I should be able to put the chat on screen. So I think there should be comments appearing on the right if somebody sends a new comment. But... I think most of you are already on YouTube and anytime I reply to a question, I'll just bring the question up. So I think this will actually just get in the way so that can go away. Okay, as I said, today's going to be a bit experimental. We're just going to see how it works and hope for the best. And yeah, we'll, we'll see how things go. Maybe Restream will become a permanent thing. Maybe I'll just move about. I think I will also try OBS at some point, but obviously I need to pipe that into something. But anyway, I am rambling. So... As I said at the beginning, I'm a theoretical physicist, I study the universe, and I love chatting about all things happening inside the universe. Happy to be experimented on if you want to do a brief timeout. Oh, thank you, David, that's good to know. I'm not gonna put anyone in timeout just yet, though. I think it's pretty obvious. I put you in timeout and then for a few minutes you can't comment, but I don't need to put anyone in timeout just now. All of you are too nice for that. So as long as everybody plays nice, I don't need to timeout. 
So as always, my objective here is to answer any questions you all have about the universe, anything you want to know about space, about cosmology, about life as a postdoc, about what it used to be like as a PhD student, about academia, about the conference I was at last week, anything you want to know, you can ask away and I will try to answer. So any questions, <coughs> any questions you have, just put them in the chat wherever you're watching from, if you're on Twitter. I do believe that if you're watching on Twitter and you've applied to the, like you reply to the tweet with the video, I will also get the comment. So if you're watching on Twitter, you can also join the conversation by just replying to my tweet. I think I think that's worked in the past. It should work now as well. But as I said, we're experimenting, we're trying things out. And I do have something I want to talk about this week. As you can see from the title, the title of the stream today is Our Black Hole. Um, you might have all seen there was an announcement in the um, in, during the week about a new a new black hole image. And I see some people saying this in the chat, so I, I should get into the YouTube thing. Like, if you like what you're hearing, please click the like button, click subscribe. You can support me on Ko-fi. There should be a link in the description to the video as well. So, um... <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm not used to like click the notification bell to subscribe, but I guess I should start saying these things. So um, yeah, like the broadcast, subscribe, leave a comment, you know, engage. This is this is how we we get the channel to grow. So please do engage in whatever way you feel comfortable doing so. You said you had a very long day. How was it at the conference? The conference last week was really nice. It was a conference on neutrino physics, which was um something I worked on. on in, during my PhD and recently I had another paper on neutrinos and it was really, really nice. We had a lot of really productive conversations, a lot of really, really interesting talks and it was fun. It was nice to be back in person, a bit scary. Fortunately, everyone took a COVID test before the conference and anyone who tested positive didn't participate in the conference and we all wore masks. So it was, it did feel quite safe despite being a lot of people. It was an amazing day. It was really, really fun. Um, it was nice to go back and network. It was nice to give an in-person talk again. And I also gave a talk at an observatory last week. I know a couple of you might have come in from the observatory. So thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, I, I actually just saw someone asking. Sorry, I, I missed your comment there, David Howden. The talk at the Munich Observatory was really, really cool. So Wednesday last week, I was at the public observatory in Munich and I gave a public outreach talk on the topic of dark matter and dark energy. It was really fun. It was my first public outreach talk in person in a very long time. And it was amazing. I was really glad I did it. Everyone was very nice, very friendly. And it was it was a really enjoyable evening. There was a bit of stress because I basically landed from the plane, like landed in Munich and I had like three hours to get myself to the observatory. But everything went smoothly, like my plane was on time. I even had time to stop at the hotel and grab a breath on my way to the observatory. So it went quite smoothly. And one really cool thing, I, I know there's a topic I want to talk about, we'll come back to it. One really nice thing, the people at the observatory actually gifted me a, a, a little baby chunk of meteorite. So I'm not sure if you can see it here, but I have a very, let's da, 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 bring it up close. I have a very, very tiny space rock. And it's shaped like a C for Cup of Cosmology. Actually, I think I should do it that way for you to see the shape. Anyway, I have this little baby space rock, which is now like a souvenir from the observatory. So I have an actual meteorite, and I'm super happy about that. So, um, yeah, I have a little baby space rock. I haven't given it a name yet, but I probably will. Thank you for your very nice comment here, Faisal. Actually, I'm just going to show that on screen, because that is a very nice comment. So thank you for that. Um, yes, as always, thank you everyone for the really nice comments. I know some of you reach out to me on Twitter or via email, and I love all of your comments, so thank you so much. What was the discovery about the mass W boson? I know I'm, I'm a bit behind, so um, let me just get to that. What is the composition? The composition of my comet, it tells me here that it, it is space metal. So in, in Germany, in German, Almetall, space metal. I think it's iron. It's basically a chunk of iron. But um, yeah, it's a chunk of iron that came from space. So it's cool. Uh, I should indeed put it in a little laminated cube. Yeah, for now, I just have it on display on my shelf. It's in a nice little box, almost like it, it's almost like a ring box, like someone's going to ask you, like, oh, here's a space rock. Just like pro note, I will always choose a space rock over a ring. But yeah, I have my little baby space rock. I do need to do something with it. For now, it's just kind of sat here on display and I wanted to show it off today. Space metal is my favorite music genre. Yeah, yeah. Well, it is, it is a good genre. It is fun. So there's a comment here by Rohit Paul. What was the new discovery about the mass W boson? 
So I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on that because that was actually the topic of my stream, I believe, three or four weeks ago. It should still be up on YouTube. It's called Particles in the Universe, and I did the entire stream about that. But very briefly, the W boson is one of the bosons that carries the weak force, and it's one that we thought we, we had good measurements of the mass. And this is something that we can theoretically predict the mass, and we can measure experimentally. And the recent experiment in the U.S., found that actually the W boson has a mass a bit higher than what we expected. And this is interesting because previous experiments in Europe have found the mass that was predicted. So obviously the, the boson should weigh the same on different continents or should have the same mass on different continents. So there appears to be a slight discrepancy. So it's very, very interesting. We don't yet know exactly what this entails or what the implications are. But do check out the stream about that. I, I won't go into too many details now because I did do the whole the whole stream about that a few weeks ago. It's called Particles in the Universe. It should be up on the YouTube channel. Actually, I think I will add that one to the highlights as well. I just want to make sure I put all the questions there because I, I know I'm already delayed with the questions. Uh, typical Americans ruining it for everyone. Yeah, typical Americans. Uh, that's why you're not allowed in Eurovision. Anyway, so um, Space Rock and Observatory and Conference aside, there was a very cool announcement this week that for the first time, we have a direct image of the black hole at the center of the Milky Way. Uh, so this is pretty big, this is pretty cool, and this is obviously something that I need to talk about today. It was a, made it very easy to choose, a, to choose a topic. And I just want to test because I, I think I can actually, can I actually write on YouTube from here? Let me just test something. Just want to see if, Everyone on YouTube just saw the message that I wrote on YouTube. If someone on YouTube can confirm that you saw my message, that would be appreciated. Find it suspicious that these black hole images look like a Krispy Kreme glazed donut. Yeah, yeah, they are very much trying to convince everyone to um, to get more donuts. <coughs> I will lead up to the image, why it's orange, why it looks the way it does, why it looks like a donut, what this means. Thank you for confirming that the comment worked. It's nice to know that from here I can directly post on YouTube. Can I directly post on Twitter? No, but I can directly post on YouTube. So that's cool. That's very nice. Okay, so um, I know I keep rambling and I'm getting, getting distracted with topics, but thank you everyone for confirming that you saw it in the live chat, perfect. And I noticed there's a slight delay in the comments, so I'm wondering if there's a slight lag. I've never tested if there's a slight lag on restream, but there might be a few seconds delay. But that's fine. We, we can work with that. We can work with that. So, yeah, this week there was the announcement that we have the first image of the black hole at the center of our galaxy. You can put clickable links in the chat, too. Very nice to know. Thank you, David. That, that's, that is very nice, actually. I might use that feature later today. Now, before I jump into why this image is special, what this image is, is showing, and you could probably share your own YouTube comment through the stream. I, I probably could as well. Yeah, I can show it on screen. It appears for me in my like unified chat here as well. So should 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 all be going back. Restream base the Restream Studio basically has 90% of the features that I liked about the original hats. And we're back in landscape. Just want to make the comment here that we are back in landscape, which is how videos should be. I can forget about the, the annoying portrait that I've been streaming in the last few months. But anyway, we are not going to dis haps. We are not going to criticize haps. That is not what we're going to do. So before we jump into the details, let's just review some, just to make sure we're all on, on the same page. Let's let's say let let's set some ground some foundations. What's the word? Lay some groundwork? Something like that. YouTube live streams seem to run at 95, 99% real time for me. Awesome. Good to know. Yeah, and you can catch up with the two times. Yeah, that is true. One nice thing about YouTube is you can always watch the replays on, on quicker, on, on faster speed, which is really nice if you're watching a slow speaker, especially for conference talks. Having recorded conference talks is so nice. Then you can just fast forward through the bits and go back when they show equations. I'm rambling. I'm, I'm easily distracted today. So let's let's start with some, some general ideas. What is a black hole? So black hole is a region of space-time or an object in the universe that has such a strong gravitational force that nothing, not even light, can escape. There are three different types of black holes that we can think of. The one we've probably heard about the most and that most of us are familiar with are stellar mass black holes. These are stars that reach the end of their lifetime and collapse. So a star is a constant battle between gravity pulling things inwards and pressure pushing things outwards. 
when a star basically used up all of its fuel, it's burnt all of its hydrogen into helium, burnt all of its helium into heavier elements. At that point, the gravitational force wins the battle because you don't have the pressure of the fusion pushing things outwards. Fusion, yes, fission. Of the fission pushing things outwards. I always need to think fission, fusion. Yeah, we do. No, we don't have the pressure of the fusion pushing things outwards. So a lot, a lot start with ads. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I, I am annoyed that YouTube has ads, but it's it's something we have to live with. I have an ad blocker for that, but yeah. So, star reaches the end of its lifetime. Once it's run out of fuel, it can no longer convert hydrogen to helium. At that point, you don't have the pressure going outwards, so the gravitational force wins. The stars will end up with a massive supernova explosion where a lot of the elements are pushed outwards, and then the core collapses to form a black hole, or a neutron star, or a white dwarf, depending on the mass. But these are stellar mass black holes, black holes that come from the collapse of a star. These are the most common types of black holes we can think of. Another type of black hole is what we call a primordial black hole. Now, a primordial black hole would have formed, they're hypothetically, hypothetical, we don't yet know if they actually exist or not, but primordial black holes would have formed in the early universe when a region of space-time is so, so, so dense that it can collapse and form a black hole without going through a star phase. It's just a region of space-time that is so dense that it directly forms a black hole. Primordial black holes like this would have been produced in the very, very early universe, if they exist at all. They may or may not still be around, around today. They may or may not account for some of the dark matter in the universe. There's a lot of unknowns when it comes to primordial black holes. But it is something that we can think about in the universe. And then we have the third type of black hole. Now, the third type of black hole we can talk about are supermassive black holes. So the stellar mass black holes that I mentioned before are usually like 30 times the mass of the sun, 50 times the mass of the sun, maybe 200 times the mass of the sun, but they were in that range. Primordial black holes would be slightly smaller, but still close to that range. Now, supermassive black holes are black holes that are at the center of galaxies. And from everything we know, from everything we've been able to see in the universe, we think that every galaxy has a supermassive black hole at the center. Like, I realized I made tea and forgot my tea. And yes, it is cucumber tea again. It's actually grown on me. What is a singularity? Nice question. I'll answer that in one sec. So, yeah, we, a supermassive black hole is at the center of every galaxy. And we call them supermassive, which, you know, kind of implies they're big, but how big? When we talk about supermassive black holes, we're talking about things that are millions of times the mass of the sun, like really millions and millions of times the mass of the sun. So this is huge. This is very big. They can even be billions of times the mass of the sun. One of the biggest bl supermassive black holes we know of is six, 66 billion times the mass of the sun. It's amazing. It's just ridiculously big object to think about. So much mass concentrated in one place. Now, to answer the question of um, doo -doo -doo, where was it? What is a singularity? A singularity is basically a fancy word to say our equations break down. So <laughs> that's a mathematical description here. But a singularity is what we put when something doesn't quite work out. For an example, if we look backwards in time, there's a point where we go to time equals zero. Now, time equals zero doesn't really make sense in any of our equations because we treat time as a dimension. So what do you do with time equals zero? You call it a singularity. The event horizon of a black hole is a singularity, but you can avoid that by just changing how you're describing the mass, which is fun. But we describe a black hole as a singularity as well. And that means that it's a point that we can't properly describe with our equations. You could also give the answer that it's a region where you like the sense of a black hole as a singularity. But this is purely a mathematical description. A singularity is just a region, a region where our current equations are no longer sufficient to explain what's happening without breaking maths. <coughs> you, know, you, you probably all heard the thing that you're not allowed to divide by zero. And what happens if you're doing an equation and at some point you get one over zero? If you can't work around it, you say I mean, it's a singularity. So a singularity is basically what we, what we use to say this is a point that is either too dense or too far back in time or too something for our current equations to be able to accurately describe it. Message comment from James here. I'm amazed that looking at objects so distant isn't distorted by gravitational lensing along the way. Excellent, excellent question there. Uh, ooh, I, I, I get distracted for like two minutes and, and suddenly there's a lot of messages to catch up with. So looking at distant objects, usually you would have gravitational lensing, but 
I will get to why you don't have so much gravitational lensing with these black holes later. Let me just make a note of that, actually, because I will come back to gravitational lensing. Because that is a, a very good question, yeah. Most galaxies, don't forget, ring galaxies like Hope objects. Yes, most galaxies, as far as we know, most galaxies have supermassive black holes at the center. <coughs> is the double... I don't know why my voice is going again today. I haven't done any talking today. Is the double star theory where star consumes its sister star trigger on the supernova, resulting in a black hole no longer plausible? This is plausible as well, actually. This is this would be the type of one type of stellar mass black hole, I believe, where you basically have two stars that can crash together, one that can eat the other one, one that can trigger a supernova. But these all fall under the umbrella term of stellar mass black hole, and their mass would be like a couple times the mass of the sun, a hundred times the mass of the sun. So um, yeah, you can have super, you can have stellar mass black holes from that way. Does this mean that time doesn't exist inside a singularity? Exactly. We do not know. So depending on the type of singularity, but in a lot of singularities, it's not that time doesn't exist. It's that we don't know how to describe anything at the point of the singularity. Some are avoidable singularities, like an event horizon. It's not a real physical thing. You can go through the event horizon and, and you wouldn't notice the event horizon. But uh, some singularities, we haven't found a way around them. So we say that they're kind of re like more real singularities. But it is really more of a mathematical thing. So I was saying we have supermassive black holes at the center of every galaxy. Now, one cool thing is we're not completely sure how supermassive black holes form. And there's also a chicken and an egg problem here. Did the supermassive black hole form first and then the galaxy formed around it? Or did the galaxy form and at the center of the galaxy a supermassive black hole collapse? It's not completely clear the relationship between the supermassive black hole and the, the galaxy, but the, it's not completely clear. But most galaxies, as far as we've been able to see, do have the supermassive black hole at the center. Then there's also the idea that maybe supermassive black holes form and normal black holes crash together. They make bigger black holes. You do this enough, you're going to end up with supermassive black holes. But supermassive black holes are billions of times the mass of the sun. Now, the cool thing about black holes, I mentioned before, black holes are regions of space-time where nothing can escape, not even light. In order to escape the gravitational pull of a black hole, you'd have to travel faster than light in a vacuum. As far as we know, nothing can travel faster than light in a vacuum, therefore nothing can escape a black hole. Now, this means that black holes are very, very difficult to see. Cucumber tea is a singularity. Yeah, we cannot mathematically describe my cucumber tea. It's actually not a bad tea. You know, the first time I had it, you, I think some of you saw my reaction on that. It was nasty. But it's kind of grown on me to the point that I'm, I've almost got through the box by now. So. And I'm honestly contemplating buying a second box. So I'm definitely on board with the tea by now. Somehow. Somehow. I'm not sure how. So the big question we need to ask is if nothing can escape a black hole, how can we ever hope to see it? And the answer is we can't. We cannot directly see a black hole because nothing can escape a black hole. There is no light coming from a black hole. But due to the huge gravitational presence, black holes will gravitationally attract things that are close by. Now, if a black hole is spinning, which we believe most of them are, because it's very difficult to get objects that are not spinning in the universe. Anything with a bit of angular momentum is going to be spinning. So if you have a black hole that is spinning, it is going to have an accretion disk around it. Now, an accretion disk basically means that matter will spiral around the black hole and gradually fall in and be eaten up. If enough matter does this, you end up with a disk. In the same way that if you, f you spin pizza dough on your finger, you get it to flatten out because of angular momentum. If you have a spinning black hole, the accretion disk around it will be a disk and not round. Now, the accretion disk is matter that is falling into the black hole. And this can be heated up because it's moving around very quickly, which means it can emit synchrotron radiation or, in general, just light. So even though we cannot see the black hole itself, we might be able to see the accretion disk around the black hole. So this is cool. We now have a way of looking at black holes. Now, the problem is, how do we go about finding where to look for black holes? How do we look at black holes? You always wonder how the stars detected orbiting our black hole at relativistic speeds experience time dilation and how that would affect their lifespan. This is an excellent question. So let me just mention, I will answer that in one sec. 
So how, how do we know black holes are there? We can see their gravitational effect on other objects. So even if we cannot directly see a black hole, we might be able to see an accretion disk, and we can see how objects move around this black hole. Now, for the black hole at the center of the Milky Way, we have been able to see, if we look at stars close to where we think the center of the Milky Way should be, there are stars moving in a specific way that can only be explained if there was a big, massive object in the center of the galaxy. And this big, massive object is what we call the black hole, the supermassive black hole at the center of the galaxy. Now, why is this called Sagittarius A star, or Sag A star for short? For short? And we can kind of infer its mass based on these objects moving around it. But this is always indirect evidence, like there's something there that we cannot see. It's probably a black hole. But what we want to do is to actually see it. Now, we have these stars moving around, uh, as the question just says here. We have these stars that have been detected orbiting around the black hole at relativistic speeds. Now, time dilation is a cool thing where objects that are moving fast experience the passage of time differently. This is something from general relativity. Now, the cool thing about this is that we always need to ask the question of with respect to who. So if I'm looking at a clock, imagine we put a clock on a spaceship and the spaceship is traveling away from me at 90% the speed of light. I will see that clock ticking differently to how my clock is ticking because I will see them traveling at the speed of light and therefore or close to the speed of light and therefore time passing differently for them. However, if someone is on that spaceship, time is relative for everyone. Not just if someone is on the spaceship, time is relative. But if there is someone on that spaceship, they will see their clocks ticking normally. And if they look back and see my clocks, they will see my clocks ticking differently because from their perspective, I'm the one moving away. Time dilation. This is something that is very nicely explained in Interstellar, where the person who travels away only experiences a few years and put people back on Earth, it's 27 years. This is actually done quite nicely. So would this affect the lifespan of the star? So we have stars moving very quickly around this black hole. Now, would that affect their lifetime in any way, not due to time dilation, because from their perspective, they're still going to experience the same amount of time. From my perspective, we will see the stars a bit differently. Now, the, the thing to consider here is that these objects, these stars have lifetimes of 9 billion years or so, at least. And the effects of time dilation might could at most hypothetically shift that by 100 years. It would not be significant compared to the lifespan of the star. So it is a very nice question here, but I would say that we don't need to worry about the relativistic speeds of the stars affecting their lifespan. And the time dilation thing then brings up the idea of who's making the, um, the observations. How can they see individual stars when it's so bright? Nice question. It's very difficult to see individual stars when we're staring at the center of the Milky Way. Now, one nice thing is that I mentioned before supermassive black holes at the center of every galaxy, but a lot of supermassive black holes actually have what we call active nuclears. They, they might have jets, they might be very high energy. The one at the center of the Milky Way is not so high energy, which means it's not as bright. I think the number is that it's about 1,000 times brighter than the sun, so it is still bright. But if you look at this, you don't need to directly see the stars around them. What you actually do is you take the spectrum of the stars around them, you get their redshift, and then you can tell if they're, you basically see if they're Doppler shifted from moving away from us or moving towards us. And we can resolve enough individual stars at the center of the Milky Way that we've been able to do this. So we do have enough resolution to get individual stars close to the center of the Milky Way, which we can then use to say there's something big there that's causing these stars to move in a strange way and that we cannot see. The indirect evidence for Sagittarius A star. Is it true that throwing an object inside a black hole is the most efficient method to turn mass of the object into pure energy? This is a very nice question. And I'm not completely sure on the answer to that because me and I don't think we can really answer this. The reason being that we don't know what happens to an object inside a black hole. Once something has fallen past the event horizon, the event horizon is the point of no return around a black hole. Once something has crossed this event horizon, it is lost to us. It cannot send back any information because information can never travel faster than, than light. Information travels at the speed of light. So what happens to this mass when you throw it into the black hole? Now, the mass has to go somewhere, so the black hole might grow slightly, but we're talking about black holes that are super, super massive. So throwing in an individual object isn't really going to change much. 
What happens to the energy content of the particle or whatever you're throwing into the black hole is also not very clear. So do we turn it into pure energy? Maybe, maybe not. The, it's the problem that once something goes past the event horizon, we can no longer access it in any way. It cannot send us any information, which means we cannot know what happens to anything that falls inside a black hole. OK, so up until now, we have these indirect images of the black hole at the center of our Milky Way. Not really images, we have these indirect proofs because we have some objects that are moving in interesting ways. Now, in order to be able to actually get direct evidence, what we would hope to do is see the accretion disk and even the shadow of the black hole. So the shadow that this black hole is leaving on the accretion disk. If you, if you throw something in, it eventually comes back out with energy through Hawking radiation. Maybe, maybe it doesn't come out in the same way. So Hawking radiation is this hypothetical idea that you can produce two particles. The universe frequently produces a particle and an empty particle out of the vacuum, which immediately annihilate and kind of return. They borrow energy from the universe, create themselves, annihilate and return the energy in the process. Very cool. However, if this process happens on the event horizon of a black hole, one particle can fall in and the antiparticle can go out or vice versa, which means they borrowed energy from the universe in order to pay it back. The black hole loses a bit of mass. So the black hole loses a bit of mass to put, procure the energy to pair create particles which are produced on the event horizon. One goes in, one goes out. Now, in this case, does this really carry the same information of something that fell into a black hole? Probably not, but it also might. So this is um this is a very interesting conversation to have. Like what happens to the information that falls into a black hole, we have no idea. We also haven't found direct evidence of Hawking radiation. It's something we think should happen, but we haven't seen it happen yet. But then what type of information is carried away by these particles? It's probably not the same information that fell into a black hole, but again, this is getting into the realm of we don't know. And then there's the idea that maybe all of the information of the black hole is contained in its surface, which gets us into holography. And that would be a whole topic that would take me a lot longer than I have time for today. We did have a, we, oh no, we didn't have, yet have holography. I have a, quite a few people in my office who work on holography. And some of them have volunteered to maybe one day join me on, on, on my live streams. So, so maybe, maybe someday we can get a forecast all about holography. If people are up for that, I will ask around. I, I will mention in the office now I have officially been requested holography, and then we can we can do that. Does it mean that black hole is creating matter? Sort of, maybe. If Hawking, it's not really the black hole that's producing the matter because it's not escaping from the black hole. This is a process that the universe does often, where you pair produce a particle and an antiparticle. So this is more the vacuum energy of the universe is doing a quantum fluctuation and producing these particles. So it's not really the black hole itself that is creating these particles, but the black hole sucks in one of them and not the other one, which means the black hole is losing mass to compensate for the production of these particles. It's strange when you think about it, the black hole is eating a particle and losing mass in the process. So. Um, yeah, definitely considering I never heard of holography. OK, I am I am not going to talk about holography myself, but I will mention and I will see if I can get someone who knows about holography. Um, maybe maybe we can get a holography stream going. I, I, get, I already know who I'm going to ask. Let's see. Matter-antimatter annihilation is pretty efficient in converting mass into energy. Yes, yes, it is. Matter Matter antimatter annihilation is a very efficient way of going from matter to energy following E equals MC squared. Energy equals mass times the speed of light squared. Will they only join when you stream from via Star Trek style holodeck? You know, if I could do a stream via a holodeck, I absolutely would. Having a holodeck would be so much fun. I think Kip Thorne believes all the mass of a black hole is used to curve space, so no mass does zero volume. Yeah. It gets complicated. Really, these questions are all very good questions, and they get very, very complicated. And it is um, it is interesting conversations to have. I have done a few streams in the past about black holes as well, which you can also go back and watch. At least one of them is on YouTube. The others will be on YouTube soon. But yeah, it's, when we get into what happens with stuff falling inside a black hole, it gets very complicated. 
Okay, back to the accretion disk. We have the matter spiraling around the supermassive black hole. Now, if we could see the accretion disk and even the shadow of the black hole on the accretion disk, this would really allow us to gain more information about the black hole. <coughs> so how do we go about measuring an accretion disk? Uh, the problem here is that these supermassive black holes are very, 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 very far away from us. So we know that there's a supermassive black hole at the center of every galaxy. So the obvious one to start with, if we want to look for supermassive black holes, is the one at the center of our galaxy. How does a particle escape the black hole Schwarzschild radius? Excellent question. Again, and I knew this was going to happen as soon as we talk about black holes. There are great questions, really. I, I love the questions. It's not escaping the black hole. Now, before you reach the event horizon, you can still turn around and go back. It would take a lot of energy, but you can do this. The point of no return, the event horizon, at that point, you would need to travel faster than the speed of light to pull out. So at that point, you can no longer pull out. But if you're not quite yet at the event horizon, if you have enough energy, you can kind of go away. You just need to accelerate away faster than it's pulling you in. If particles appear produced on very, very close to the event horizon, imagine they're produced in opposite directions because one falls in, one goes out. So then this particle that goes out could be traveling almost at the speed of light. And because it's not quite yet at the event horizon, it would still be able to escape. So it is not escaping from the black hole itself. It is not the black hole emitting a particle. It is a particle being created right next to the black hole and escaping. So it is really not being emitted from the black hole itself. Hope that helps. Right, so we want to see a supermassive black hole. They're at the center of every galaxy, so we have quite a few to choose from. But most galaxies are very far away. So the obvious thing is to start with a supermassive black hole at the center of the Milky Way. Now, the problem is this is 26,000 light years away. So our galaxy is huge. Looking to the center of our galaxy is 26,000 light years away. Even though supermassive black holes are massive, our best estimate of the supermassive black hole at the center of the Milky Way, Sagittarius A star, is that it's 4.2 million times the mass of the sun. So we have a black hole that is 4.2 billion times the mass of the sun. The event horizon of the black hole, or what we call the Schwarzschild radius, is about 10% the distance between the sun and the earth. So this is a massive object, really, really massive object, really, really big. But it is 26,000 light years away, which means it is ridiculously small and therefore very difficult to see. Now, in order to see something so small, you need a very big telescope. And the thing is, you need a telescope about the size of the Earth. Now, obviously, we can't build a telescope the size of the Earth. But what we can do is what the Event Horizon Telescope Collaboration have done, where you take several radio telescopes across the world and you string them together. And then the idea is you, you have a combination of eight telescopes on the Earth, eight telescopes, and together they all map part of the sky as the Earth is rotating. They will map different parts of the sky. And then you can put all of these images together and pretend you have one big telescope with several small mirrors. And this is what the Event Horizon Telescope Collaboration do. So they turn the whole planet into a telescope, basically, by using eight telescopes, a network of eight telescopes spread across the globe. They string them together, and then they basically have a mirror the size of the planet. And with that, they can hope to look at really, 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 really tiny things in the universe, like supermassive black holes. So the Event Horizon Telescope was the collaboration that was set up a couple of years ago with the objective of taking a direct image of the accretion disk of the supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy and the supermassive black hole in the center of M87, Messier Object 87, which is a close by galaxy that we also know has a supermassive black hole. And I just saw another comment here for the record. I'm not going to make a joke about the difficulty of pulling out quickly. I appreciate that. So the particle pops into existence at the event horizon. Exactly. Just, just, just like very close to the event horizon, but not yet in the event horizon. Just very, very close. Only eight. Yeah, there are only eight telescopes, but they are really impressive radio telescopes. And when you put them together, they map out different parts of the sky. You add the fact that the Earth is rotating. One, one thing to think about it is, one way to think about it, imagine the Earth is a giant disco ball, you know, with the tiny little mirrors reflecting light, but it only has five or six, or in this case, eight of the mirrors. 
as it turns around, you're going to fill in the gaps and get more of it. So basically, we want the Earth to behave like a giant disco ball. And we use these telescopes to fill in more and more gaps on the disco ball as the disco ball rotates, or in this case, as the Earth rotates, you might get a line of disco balls or a line of mirrors on your disco ball. So we're gradually trying to fill in our disco ball. Once you have enough telescopes taking images every night for enough time, you can gradually fill it in and get the angular resolution you need to, to actually be able to measure these supermassive black holes. I wonder if the space telescopes could coordinate with the Earth telescopes. I think it would be quite difficult because, because currently, the, the problem is we want big mirrors, and it's very difficult to put big mirrors in space. We've only just been able to do it with just one full space telescope. And that one still doesn't have the same type of resolution of joining the eight together. Could we use that to fill in gaps? I, I think there's a valid reason why not, but currently I can't think exactly why not. Other than you have different noise interference in space and on the ground, it's slightly different. So yeah, I'm going to go for now that no, generally because the radio telescopes that we're using here on Earth are like 30 meters in diameter, and we're stringing together these 15, 20 meter telescopes, however big they are, and they are massive, massive telescopes. And I don't think there's any space-based mission that could really contribute significantly to the angular resolution, I think. Is that your lecture in Munich? Great, thank you for being here. No, very, very nice to, to be here. Why aren't there any radio telescopes like the Southern Africa, like in Southern Africa? I, I think it's always a problem of paying for the telescope. And also, we really need to be careful about how we colonize places to build telescopes, because this is completely fucked up. And not getting into the politics of it, building a radio telescope is difficult. And you normally require like a high altitude is one thing that helps because then you don't have as much noise so you usually go to places that have high altitude very clear skies and where you might have the means to build a telescope i think there might be one radio telescope in africa but i cannot remember which one i'm really bad at remembering where telescopes are located but i think there might be one in in africa as well but in general you build them in places that have high elevation very clean skies and where they're easier to build I hope that answers the question. And I'm glad you found your way from the, the talk at the Observatory to the YouTube channel. So, um, yeah, <laughs> got these are all excellent, excellent questions. Meerkat is in South Africa. Thank you, David. I knew there was one that was in South Africa. Yes, the Meerkat radio telescope should be in South Africa. I knew there was one. I was just trying to think which one, which one it was. So the Event Horizon Telescope Collaboration take these eight telescopes, they turn it, they basically turn the whole Earth into a mirror, and then they try to look at different black holes. The two specific ones they've been trying to look at is the one at the center of our galaxy and the one at the center of M87, which is the galaxy close by. Three years ago, the Event Horizon Telescope released the first image ever of M87. I did a whole stream about it. I did another stream about it quite recently. And you might all have remember this glowing orange donut, very, very nice image of M87. This was very impressive. This was the first ever image of the accretion disk around a black hole. And a lot of people at that point said, like, why did we start with the galaxy over there and not with our own galaxy? Like, wouldn't it make more sense to start with our own galaxy? There's a problem. There's a couple of problems that make coming to our galaxy difficult. But it meant zero volume infinite density. Yes, yes, that makes sense. Uh, I know that was a comment, re a reference to the question before about the volume and the density of a black hole. Yes, donuts. Yes, yes, donuts. So um, <laughs> I'm very easily distracted today. Apologies for that. So, so years ago, they released the image of the nearby galaxy, M87, of the black hole of the nearby galaxy, M87. And to get the one at our galaxy is required a bit more work. And there's a couple of reasons for this. Now, the first one is that if you steer towards the center of the Milky Way, there's a lot of stars between us and the center of the Milky Way. So there's a lot of stuff that gets in the way, which means there's a lot you have to clean. But there's something else. Um, it's the fact that the secretion disk, the, the light moving around a black hole, or the matter that's spinning around a black hole, which we hope to see, moves at almost the speed of light. Right, it's almost the speed of light. Now, if we look at the two galaxies, 
we have M87, we have Rs. We focus on the black holes. The black hole in M87 is 1,000 times heavier or more massive than the black hole in the center of our galaxy. But it is also 1,000 times further away. This combination of being 1,000 times bigger but 1,000 times further away mean that they appear the same size in the night sky. This is also something that happens with the sun and the earth. You know, the, sorry, the sun and the moon. The sun and the moon in the night sky look the same, or in the day sky, look the same size, even though one is a lot bigger. The sun happens to be about 400 times bigger than the moon in terms of radius, and also 400 times further away, which is why they appear the same size, which is why we get eclipses. The same is true for these two black holes. Even though the black hole at the center of our galaxy is 26,000 light years away, the black hole at the center of M87 is 53 million light years away. But our black hole is 4.2 million solar masses. The other one is 6.5 billion solar masses. So you, you have the factor 1000 in both cases, which means that our galaxy black hole and M87 galaxy black hole look the same in the night sky. But this makes it a lot harder to see eyes. The reason being, going back to what I was just saying, the accretion disk is moving around this black hole practically at the speed of light. Now, if you take the size of M87 black hole and that something is moving around at the speed of light, it's going to take about a week for the accretion disk to do a full circle. So it's moving quite, it's moving at the speed of light, but from our perspective, it's moving slowly. It's going to take a whole week for the disk to do a full rotation. However, our own black hole is a thousand times smaller, which means it only takes a few minutes for the disk to do one full revolution. Now, why is this a problem? Imagine you're trying to take a picture of a dog that is chasing its tail. You know, you have a very old dog that is just leisurely chasing its tail. You can take a picture. But if you have a dog really quickly, like a hyperactive puppy chasing its tail, and you try to take a picture of it, it is going to be moving a lot, which means your image is going to be a lot harder to take. And this is why it's taken three years more to get the image of our own black hole. So rambling a bit here, is Sagittarius is responsible for keeping the Milky Way galaxy in shape? Good question, excellent question. We're not completely sure. So galaxies should be stable without supermassive black holes, but it does seem that every galaxy has a supermassive black hole, but the interplay between a supermassive black hole and the galaxy is not completely clear. Which, which comes first, which produces which, it's not completely clear. So it's an excellent question that there's not a clear answer to. So yeah, three years ago, let's just recap because I know I've been rambling, but three years ago, the Event Horizon Telescope collaboration put out the first image of the galaxy, of the black hole at the center of M87. This was amazing. It was the first direct evidence of black holes. It was the first direct evidence of there being a black hole, at the, a supermassive black hole at M87 galaxy. And it was our first direct image of a black hole. Three years later, this week, they called a press conference, actually last, last week they called a press conference for the 12th, saying they had an update for the black hole at the center of our galaxy. So after three years of trying to figure out how to photograph a puppy chasing its tail and how to use only eight telescopes on Earth to peer into the center of our galaxy and delete everything else in between, they have finally produced the image of the galaxy at the center of our, sorry, at the black hole at the center of our galaxy. So I, I, I know this is the, the topic of today and it's 50 minutes in and I haven't shown the image yet, but I'm, I'm trying, I hope I'm building it up so you appreciate just how difficult it was to get this image. And just, just to make it clear how difficult it is. You know, if you look around the night sky, you can divide the night sky into 360 degrees all around you. Now, if an object occupies 10 degrees on the night sky, it's big, it's easy to see. If an object occupies one degree on the night sky, then it's getting difficult to see. Now, this, this black hole, from our perspective, this black hole at the center of the Milky Way occupies 0 0.0000001 degrees of the night sky. That's 10 to the minus 8 degrees. So that's, what, that's 10 millionths. So if you divide one degree, so you divide the night sky into 360 degrees, and then you divide one of those degrees into one million, you take a tenth of that, 
That is the size that we're talking here. That is the angular resolution we need in order to really measure this, which is ridiculous when you think about it. So just to give you the idea here, we're basically trying to see a, a donor or a bagel on the moon. Imagine I tell you now one of the astronauts has left a bagel on the moon. Go find it for me from here. The telescope you would need, the resolution you would need is incredible. Now, add to that that we're looking through the Milky Way at something that is spinning really, really quickly. How on earth did they manage to get this image? Incredible. So with that in mind, now that I've hopefully built it up, I just want to answer one question here. Regarding the sun and moon matching apparent size, is that due to relative mass and mechanics of stable orbits? It's just a happy coincidence. If it weren't the case, we wouldn't have eclipses. It's really just a nice, happy coincidence. OK, so I hope now I've um, hyped it up enough that I can actually get to sharing the image. And I'm not going to start with the image. I'm going to start with the video that they release because to me it always makes it better. So it's time to meet Sagittarius A star. So let's press play on the video. I... Let's share the video. Here we go. Let's meet it. So we look at the direction of the sky where we have Sagittarius. We zoom in. Should this anything? So we gradually zoom in. These are all existing images we've had in the past. Still zooming in, still zooming in. Just want to, this video really gives you the idea of just how far away we're looking. And now we're going to finally see the first direct image of the supermassive black hole in the center of our galaxy. Here you have it, our own, our own black hole. So, this image that you can see here is the first direct image ever of the black hole at the center of the Milky Way. This is very, very, very cool. Consider that the resolution we need here is the same resolution we would need to see a donor on the moon. Or as someone else phrased it in the press conference on Thursday, if you are sat in New York having a beer, and I'm sat in Berlin having a beer, Imagine if you wanted to see the bubbles in my beer glass from New York, and I'm sat in Berlin. That is the type of resolution we need to get this image. And yet, we still have it. Questions that I'm sure you're asking, what are we seeing here? What we're seeing here, this orange thing, is the accretion disk. The matter sp spinning around the black hole and gradually being sucked up. Now, this does not, what you can see in the center, this black thing in the center, is the shadow of the black hole. So it's not the black hole itself, but it's the shadow. What this means here is the black hole it has a huge gravitational presence. It's distorting the light all the way around it, but we cannot directly see the light that is right behind the black hole. We can see light elsewhere that's being distorted around it, but there's always a shadow in the middle. So the shadow in the middle is the black hole itself. The matter spinning around it, this orange thing is the accretion disk. This does not mean we're looking at it edge on because of the way it's distorting light this disk could be in a different angle. But this is the accretion disk. This is the first direct image ever of the black hole at the center of our galaxy. You like the beer analogy, but it doesn't take into account the curvature of the Earth. Yeah, yeah. It just gives you an idea of the type of thing we need. That's why I prefer the bagel on the moon analogy. OK. One question that a few people might have and that I think was asked at some point before, why is this orange? That is a great question. Um, this is a radio image. So just going back to the idea of the poppy spinning, this is not one still image. This is data they took for five years every night taking data. And then they put all the images together. They actually divided the team into four people. They built their own algorithms. They basically did the work four times. Everyone came up with an image and they put them all together to get this here. This amazing image of the, the, the Milky Way. Why is it orange? It's actually not. This is a false color image. Now, all of these observations are made using radio telescopes, which means the actual data is in grayscale. It's in black and white. But we're very bad at distinguishing features when it's in grayscale. So the astronomers choose a specific color map. And it's just the standard thing that you choose orange as your color map. There's one going from black to white. So the lighter the color, the more intense the light is. This is a choice you could equally use Viridis or any color map of your choosing, but they choose to use the Solaris color map, which means it ends up being orange, white, and black. Next question you might be asking, what are these three big dots? Why are there three dots? 
Now again, we have this mass uh, spiraling around this black hole very, very, very quickly. This means that what you're actually seeing here is this blurry image, but the regions where there's more intense light means that it's traveling towards you. The regions where there's less intense light means it's traveling away from you. So this helps us figure out which direction we're looking at the black hole on. So you kind, if you kind of imagine an arrow going like towards you, so from the back of the screen towards you, that's the direction we think this is spinning. So the spin of this black hole is not aligned with the spin of the Milky Way. And thanks to this observation, we've been able to say it is probably no more than 50 degrees of inclination with respect to us. They could also be artifacts. Yes, they could be. The, the, I think most of the Raleigh's paper said that it's probably the Doppler shift because of the fact that we're averaging over so many images. It's unlikely to be one resolved thing. It's more the way the, the thing is spinning, the way the accretion disk is spinning. What this image also shows us is that things are behaving pretty much like we would expect them to within general relativity, which is also very cool. So not only do we now have the first image of the black hole at the center of our galaxy, we now have proof, indisputable proof, that there is a black hole, a supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy, and we know what it looks like. And there was another, another video I had prepared. What was the other video? Yes. So I want to go back to the, what I was saying before about the size comparison. I'm going to stop sharing this one. Do, do, do. Stop sharing is that button there. And I'm going to share a different video now to show. Actually, before I get to the videos, I'm going to show the images side by side because it is always very, very nice to see the images side by side. So we have the first image of the black hole. And now we have two images that we can put side by side. So the image you see here on the left is the one that was released three years ago for M87. This is the famous donut. The one you can see on the right is Sagittarius A star, our own one. One question, why is ours more blurry? This goes back to the two things. We have a lot of stuff between us and the center of the Milky Way, and it is spinning very, very, very quickly. So it is harder to resolve. The different positions of the brighter blobs tell us how differently they're spinning. But these images are remarkably similar. And this is really cool because we have two very different galaxies of two very different sizes with supermassive black holes that are very, very, very different masses. The one on the left here, M87, is a billion times, or five, 50 billion times, sorry, 6 million times the mass of the sun on the left. The one on the right, our own one, is 4 million times the mass of the sun. So we have one thousand, a factor 1,000 different than the mass. And yet, these images look almost the same. And this is really cool because this tells us that black holes behave exactly as we expect they would within general relativity. Any effects we see beyond this is caused by the accretion disk or by the galaxies themselves, but the black holes behave the same. So we have vastly different galaxies, we have vastly different black holes, but they behave the same, as Einstein predicted they would. Once again, this shows us that everything is behaving as general relativity tells us it should behave. So this is really impressive. Not only have we achieved incredible resolution to pick out something that is a millionth of a degree in the night sky, this image on the right, we've been able to do this now with two different black holes. And we've been able to see that both of these black holes behave the same. That both of these black holes, supermassive black holes, have an accretion disk. Both of them actually exist, and they follow general relativity. This is amazing when you think about it, just the resolution needed to get these images, the amount of work that went into getting these images. They, they look like frog eyes. Yeah, they kind of do, actually. I mean, we, we say they look like donuts, but they do kind of look like frog eyes as well. So these, these images, you know, I, I try to do them justice by stating how hard it is to get them. What I don't have time to talk about or expertise to talk about is the three years of developing new machine learning algorithms to fill in the gap in their disco ball Earth telescope. The years going into trying to get these images yes, less blurry. The amount of data they've had to plow through. There's a TED talk about how they go about get, getting this data. There's a bunch of experts who've done videos about this. And honestly, you'd need like two whole lectures to explain how they get these images. The amount of ingenuity and creativity that goes into getting this. And who comes up with the idea of let's just turn the whole planet into a telescope? It's, it's incredible. 
And yet, here we have proof that we can do this, which is very, very, very cool. Now, there's some other images that I do want to show you. And sorry if I've missed some of the comments. I know I got distracted a bit here with the images. So now I want to show you a comparison because these things look the same in the night sky or they look the same size. What would they actually look like if we put them side by side? And I, I can answer that question because I have another video ready. So all of the videos and images I'm showing today are produced by the European Space Observatory or by the, Einstein, the um, Event Horizon Telescope. It's a combination of different places, but now we're going to see how these look for you from Earth. So what you see currently is their size in the night sky with Sagittarius A being 27,000 light years away and M87 being a lot further away, nearly 5 million light years away, 53 million light years away, sorry. So now what we're going to do is we're going to move M87 gradually closer so you can see how big it would look in the night sky if it was actually in the same place. So I hope you can see that this is gradually moving closer and closer and closer still, still further away, but it's getting there. And this is where we can pause it. So I hope you all saw the zooming in there, just how big this would look in the night sky if they were actually the same distance away. But we have the nice thing that M87 is really, really far away. So these objects actually appear to be the same size in the night sky, which is very, very cool. And I want to show you one more thing, which is just to really give an idea of the sizes here. And the other last image I wanted to show you is this one here. Now, this is the same two images side by side, just showing you a few things. I'm not sure if it's pixelated. I hope not. What you can see on the left is M87. Don't move it too close. I don't want our galaxy to be absorbed. Yeah, it, it's a good thing that this is not clo that close. But what you can see here on the left is M87. And you can see that there's kind of this circle in the middle that is described as Pluto's orbit. So you could fit all of, all of the solar system inside the shadow on the left-hand side. Like just within that circle in the middle, you can fit Pluto's orbit. And then if you zoom in very, very, very much on the right, you can see the size comparison of Sagittarius A, where we kind of fill out to Mercury's orbit if we consider the whole thing. So these are vastly different sizes, vastly, vastly different supermassive black holes. And yet the images look exactly as Einstein predicted they would, exactly as, we, well, not Einstein himself, exactly as we can predict using Einstein's general relativity, which is really cool because once again, we're finding that things can be well described by general relativity. Things are behaving the way we expect them to. So we now have the first direct image of the black hole at the center of the Milky Way the first generation to ever have this. We've got the necessary angular resolution, the necessary technology to actually get this image. Not only does this give us direct evidence that there is a black hole, a supermassive black hole at the center of our Milky Way, it also shows us approximately how it's rotating. It also shows us that black holes, regardless of the size, appear to obey general relativity. And the very cool thing that I just brushed over just now is it shows us that this black hole is not aligned with the Milky Way. And this is strange because we have one other thing in the Milky Way which makes us think it could be aligned. And now we've realized that it's not. So there's two explanations here. Either at some point it got misaligned, which means maybe at some point our galaxy merged with another one. Maybe our supermassive black hole let another black hole. Or maybe the other observation isn't telling us what we think it's telling us. So this image is going to help us uncover the history of the Milky Way, which is very, very cool. A couple of que questions here. If we can compress anything smaller than its shortest child radius, then we can turn that object into a black hole. Yeah, if you take the Earth and you compress it down to about 11 centimeters, you'd produce a black hole. I mean, you shouldn't, but hypothetically, if you could crush the Earth, keep its same mass and make it about, 11, about this big, you turn it into a black hole. We have a cute little supermassive black hole. We do indeed. What's next? Great question. They took data for this into between 2017 and 2020. So it's three years of data and then a lot of, no, it was two years of data taking and then all of the processing to get it to where it is today. They want to get more precision. They want to look at these black holes even better. And I believe they now have a different target as well, which is a, another galaxy close by. 
Now, there were a couple of open questions. Someone asked before gravitational lensing, why are these objects not gravitationally lensed? Now, my answer to that would be that in order to have gravitational lensing, you usually need something like a huge clump of dark matter. And when we're talk talking on small scales like 10 millimeters, it might be 10 millimeters. I know it's 11.8, it's either 11.8 centimeters or 11.8 millimeters. It might be millimeters, actually. You might be right there, Scott. Yes, radius, yes. Always oh, talking about radius. So, um, trailer thought, yes. Gravitational lensing. Why aren't these images gravitationally lensed? Now, usually gravitational lensing happens when we look the moon is nine millimeters. So if the moon is nine millimeters, the earth must be of the order of centimeters. That would make sense because then you have a factor of 10 conversion. Yeah. So it must be, I, it's about, I remember it was like this big. If you want the earth to be kind of football sized, you'd end up turning it into a black hole. So usually gravitational lensing is something that happens when you're looking from one galaxy to another or distant, the light coming from distant stars. And then this light has to travel through clouds of dark matter. Now, even though there is dark matter all around us in the galaxy, it wouldn't really be enough to produce gravitational lensing on these small scales. So it's not something we need to, to concern ourselves about directly here. So we don't have an effect of gravitational lensing here. I hope that answers the question. I know this was like very early on in the stream, but I did make a note of that. And I was thinking about the answer. So I think we don't need to worry about gravitational lensing on these scales. So I see there is a debate going on. This can be very, very easily resolved by plugging it into the formula. I'm not going to do the back of the envelope calculation now, but you can just plug it into the formula and figure out how big you'd need to make the Earth Air homework exercise for everyone. Don't worry, you don't have to do homework. You can if you want. How big would you need to make the Earth in order for it to be a black hole? You can take the, radi the formula for the Schwarzschild radius, which is the radius is equal to times the gravitational constant times the mass divided by c squared, which is the speed of light squared. You can plug in numbers and figure out how big we need to make things. OK, there was another question that someone sent in advance of how does this compare to M87? I think I've answered that question. And how does it compare to interstellar? But now the interstellar black hole is actually a very nice description of how black holes would look. They came up with a lot of nice techniques. But the big difference is there they were always looking in optical. Here we're looking in radio. But it is very, very similar to if you put the, uh, the image of the interstellar black hole next to this one, You'll actually see the similarities, so that is nice. And another question that I promise I would answer today is what happens if a gravitational wave hits a black hole? And I love this question. Now, gravitational waves are ripples in the fabric of space-time. They, they vibrate space-time, basically. A black hole is a region where space-time is really, really, really bent. Now, you would have some interference here. If a gravitational wave hits any massive object, it is going to experience a very slight change. Now, in terms of a black hole, you have to imagine here, let's first think of a black hole that is perfectly stationary, not in, in an orbit with anything else. Um, yeah, Earth is 9 millimeters and Moon is 0 0.2 millimeters. Awesome. So we have confirmation. Google answered it rather than plugging it into the formula. I'm not going to complain about you cheating on your exam question there. So yeah, you need the Earth to be 9 millimeters in radius, the Moon to be 0 0.2 millimeters in radius. I believe the numbers that people have just Googled here. OK, so gravitational waves, ripples in space time, if they hit any object that is curving space time, they will be slightly distorted. But it's not enough for us to actually notice anything. The effect would be really, really small. And it also wouldn't have any effect in the other direction. Like the gravitational wave would not impact the black hole in any way. What is very interesting to think about is if you have a gravitational wave and two spiraling black holes, because they're then they're producing other gravitational waves, and then you get interference. And then you have like the combination of multiple gravitational wave signals overlapping. Thank you for the nice comment there, Paul. Really, Paul, I'm glad you enjoyed the stream. So I think I've answered all of the questions that I was sent in advance and all of the questions that came up today, hopefully. But the main thing here is that we now have the first direct evidence, the first direct image of our own black hole. The black hole that is 27,000 light years away at the center of the Milky Way, 4.2 million times the mass of the sun. And we now have a photo of it. We now have an image of what it looks like. And it is a very pretty image. It looks like a donut. And the resolution we needed to do this was incredible. The technology we needed for this was amazing. And it's, it's incredible that we are 
alive at a time where we can get these images, where we can do science with them, where we can say, look, like, black holes behave the same regardless of the mass. This is amazing. I actually missed the live announcement because I was in a three hour long meeting and then I went back and rewatched it. But it was really, really nice to actually get these images. And I hope I've convinced you all that these images are really, really cool. And we went over the hour mark here. I knew we would. Anytime I talk about these topics, we go over the hour mark, but that's fine. So thank you everyone for joining. This has been great fun. I think things seem to work pretty smoothly with the um, restream going out to YouTube. I hope we also went out to Twitter. I will check afterwards if the Twitter connection worked as well. I know I've lost some followers with apps closing down. I really hope everyone does migrate over to, to YouTube for me because, um, yeah, I hope you continue following me on YouTube, on Twitter, wherever you are, you know, subscribe, click like, leave, leave a comment down below. And if anyone wants to support me, thank you very much. Um, I, I'm on Kofi. There should be a link in the description on YouTube, or you could just find me on Kofi slash co hyphen co hyphen feed.com slash DC Hooper 91. All seems to be very um, connected everywhere. If you feel like supporting me, thank you. I do appreciate it. And if anyone has any feedback about how this worked, I see some very nice comments here. Thank you very much. If anyone has any comments you want to throw at me, as always, you can reach out to me on Twitter or contact at cosmology, contact at cupofcosmology.com or just go to the webpage cupofcosmology.com. And from there, you can find all the links you need to follow me and to contact me. So I should be online again next Sunday. I don't yet have a topic planned. If you have any topic requests, do let me know. Maybe I try to get a guest for next Sunday. I should be online again next Sunday, same time as today. And I will do it so that you get both the, that you get the YouTube notification at least a few hours in advance. And as always, you can tune in also on Twitter. So I hope to see you all again next Sunday, same time as today. And I hope in the meantime, you'll stay safe and take care of each other.